Rare fans were treated with a Q&A panel held at the Herbert Art Gallery and Museum on September 15, 2018. James Thomas, Paul Machisek, Joe Niet, Robin Beanland, and Greg Males answer several of fans' questions about game development, Sea of Thieves, for some reason Grab by the Ghoulies 2, and of course, everyone's favorite, Banjo-Kazooie. Actually, it was mostly Greg who spoke about Banjo-Kazooie. I'm going to play three clips for you. The first clip talks about Banjo's origins, more specifically Project Dream. I'm sure some of you know the whole story already, but I'm going to assume some of you don't. So that will be the first clip. If you want to skip through the Project Dream story, if you think you know you could about it and the topic isn't interesting to you anymore, you can skip ahead to this timestamp to when Greg starts talking about the juicy stuff. The rated E stuff. The innuendo. It's a pretty funny interaction at the beginning. He doesn't really go into detail about the innuendo, but he does explain that how their humor evolved over the years. In the last clip, Greg talks about the Banjo sequel we were all waiting for in 2008. Nuts and bolts, the whole idea behind it, everything about it. There is a reason behind that decision, making it a, a car game. He also talks about what Banjo was going to be before Nuts and Bolts and why that was dropped. Now, on to the first clip. Uh, what was the inspiration for the Banjo-Kazooie series as we all turn to Greg? <laughs> uh, you probably, by asking that question, you probably know the history a little bit of Banjo, how it started off as, as Dream. Um, so for the benefit of people that don't, once we'd finished doing Donkey Kong Country, we, we, we took the graphics technology and thought, what else could we do with this um, instead of a platform game? So we're all, we're all massive fans of Zelda, so we thought, could we apply that kind of same graphics technology to uh, an adventure game? So, so we spent a couple of months kind of messing around with the graphics to see whether we could do it. And by that point, we got this... This, this lead character that was like a young boy with a with a wooden sword, so that so they so obviously inspired a bit by Link, but we we went like kind of it was almost inspired probably by my kind of my childhood growing up as a, as a kid. I'd like make things out of wood. I'd make my own armor and swords and shields, and then like batter my brother and and our friends. So <laughs> so I wanted this kind of feel of like he wasn't like a hero. He didn't have a proper sword. It felt like something he'd made. Um, and, and, and kind of dream progressed for a while and we struggled with the technology and, and we realized it wasn't going anywhere. Um, and I think we'd seen this, we'd had this game with this young boy in it for so long that we, we got pretty much fed up with looking at him. So we thought, right, let's, let's change it to something else. We're fed up with this boy. Um, so we thought, let's, let's make it an animal instead. I don't know why, but we did. Um, and we tried a rabbit to start with. Um, I think it lasted two days because it looked absolutely terrible. Um, and then the next thing we tried was a bear. And that bear was Banjo. Um, and it was uncanny how similar that bear that we first drew in Dream, in an adventure game, actually became uh, Banjo um, in the game. Like, the fact he wears a backpack has got nothing to do with Kazooie whatsoever. The fact he wears a backpack is because it was an adventure game and the, the idea was you go around collecting all this stuff and he'd store it in his backpack and then fetch it out when it, need, when it was needed. So, so Kazooie wasn't even in it at that point. Um, and then we were fortunate enough to see um, a really, really early version of Mario 64, uh, way, way before anyone else had seen it. It was this very simple demo of Mario running around on these really simple 3D blocks and we thought what we're doing is going to be so outdated so we basically scrapped everything we did that we were doing with Banjo at that point and basically rebuilt it, wrote our own 3D engine and basically we, we took everything out of the old dream apart from Banjo because we liked the bear character. We thought well, well let's take that character, put it in a game that's a bit like Mario, put our twist on it and that's the game that eventually became Banjo-Kazooie. Uh, so, have we got into trouble for our sense of humour with, uh, with our um, platform um, holders? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Many, <laughs> many, many times. Are there um, any that we can reveal here? Um, be careful. Oh, we'll be careful. <laughs> um, I thought he was just about to pull out a list. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, I think we've... 
certainly Rares, Rares games are always kind of E-rated or kind of like younger audience, but um, we were all massive fans of The Simpsons, and The Simpsons is a, a really good example of multi-layered humour where there's things in there for kids, and then there's stuff that's aimed at a slightly older audience, and we all kind of, we all love The Simpsons, so we started trying to think along the same lines. It's like, okay, this game's got an E-rating, but but what what could we squeeze in there? Um, then it became it became almost a game between us trying to fit things in um, and legal departments and publishers trying to spot them and take them out. Um, and I, think, I don't think any of it was malicious. We just wanted our games to have that edge, to have that humour, to kind of, for older players to see things in the game or read things and appreciate it. So we didn't do it because we were just being idiots. We were just, we were just trying to kind of have some fun and... Yeah, sometimes we probably overstepped the line and fortunately they, they were spotted and we took them out and we're all um, a little bit more mature these days. So even though we, we, we still put Easter eggs... To scale. Right. To scale, yeah. 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 yeah, well, to scale. <laughs> we did actually have a, a skeleton as our Twitter handle for a while, so uh, yeah. I don't think that that kind of sense of humour is going to go away anytime soon, but um, I still think... There's, there's still room to try and put things in. Like if you read through the dialogue in Sea of Thieves, there's definitely some um, double meaning in there. There's, there's definitely some nods to future games. There's, there's, there's nods to all sorts of things. But I think maybe whereas in the past it was very much in your face, it's a lot more subtle these days. So um, you have to work a lot harder to find it. How and why did Banjo 3 transform from a straight sequel into Nuts and Bolts? Uh, yeah, pretty much because I'd got bored doing this, the previous formula. Uh, we'd done, uh, obviously, the first game, and then the second game was <clears throat> more of the same, but kind of bigger and, uh, and, and cleverer. I, I just didn't feel I had anywhere left to go by doing a third one that was exactly the same. So, so we started exploring different, what could we do differently for a third game that maybe would take people by surprise, kind of um, sh shake the genre up a bit. Um, and the first, the first idea was to actually do a remake of Banjo One, um, but then change the gameplay. So, so when you started the game, it made it look like it was exactly the same game with better graphics. But then, the more you played, we'd actually change things that happened in the level. So, in the first level with Mumbo's Mountain, the um, the mountain was going to break open. There was going to be this massive termite that came out the top. So, so players that would have played it before, it was like, it's the same game, but it's different. Um, but um, I think ultimately we were concerned that it would just be seen as a remake, even if it was clever. So, so then, we, then we started dabbling with an idea where it was like a more traditional banjo game, but the player played at the same time as, as Grunty, and Grunty was AI, and she'd be running around the levels trying to collect the jigsaw at the same time. So it was like a, it was almost a battle between um, you playing banjo and then Grunty as AI playing a traditional banjo game. But um, we kind of turned that one down because of the problems with AI. We, we didn't think we could make AI, AI that good enough to, to warrant the game. So, so kind of third time lucky uh, was, was kind of looking at all platform games, like when, when you get to do the puzzles and the, and the fun bits, as, as I call them, they were really cool. Um, but the bits in between were quite boring. There's like lots of walking around on levels. Um, I think I called it the traveling. So I looked for a way to try and make the traveling fun um, and kind of hit upon the idea that rather than the character walking, what about if he, if he rode? Um, so, so to try and make the traveling fun, but then I wanted players to decide how they were going to travel, hence the creation of vehicles. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of where it came from. Um, and I, I, I still love the game. Um, I know it didn't um, do that well, and I know there's a lot of banjo purists out there that didn't, probably wasn't their their kind of first choice. But I think it was a very ambitious project, and and that the editor we wrote to put the vehicles together was probably one of the best pieces of software I've ever seen written at Rare. Um, and I think the game's still fun, and I think when Rocket League came out a few years ago, I thought, mm, that's actually Banjo Nuts and Bolts. Um, <laughs> we were, we were kind of ahead of our time, but maybe didn't quite package it right. 